Thank you very much for having me. Um, the topic that I'm going to talk about today is the Biodiversity Heritage Library, and we're just um, my project is involved with just one small node, as Adrian described. It's the Australian branch of the of the project, which I'm hoping will might be able to expand to include some representation from New Zealand as well. So every scientist stands on the shoulders of those that have gone before. In particular, the sciences of taxonomy and bioinformatics are the sort of disciplines that involve as much time in the library as in the laboratory. The study of species that make up the world's biodiversity requires reference to a large body of, of scientific literature, and much of it stand, spans for centuries. Academic libraries house, house large collections of this stuff, and natural history museums in particular hold very focused collections of literature pertaining to the scope of their collection. And a terrific resource though these may be, they usually have one major drawback and that is that they're not located where the biologist would ra most ra like to be, that is out collecting in the field. And furthermore, as anyone who's familiar with Murphy's Law would agree, the one book that we most desire when we're undertaking research, it's always the one that's missing, or on loan, or was deemed not to uh, fit in with the acquisition policies of the librarian of the day. So the Biodiversity Heritage Library was it began as a way of solving some of these problems and it started out as a consortium of some of the heavyweights of natural history museums and botanic gardens and academic institutions in the uh, United States and England and the UK. The goal of the Biodiversity Heritage Library has been to digitise as much of the literature relating to biological sciences as possible and make it accessible online. Underlying this endeavour is a philosophy that the body of knowledge contained within makes up the legacy of human understanding about the species in the world that we live in, and as such should be freely available to everyone. With founding members such as the Smithsonian Institution, Natural History Museum in London, Kew Gardens, Woods Hole, American Museum of Natural History, all of the big guns in uh, natural science collections, uh, a fair whack of the literature has already been scanned. It's still uh, a long way to go, but at the moment there's around 103,000 volumes available online for you to look at. And that's growing. In fact, since I wrote this, I looked online last night and it's 104,000. So there you go. <laughs> the project aims to be truly global in its reach and it's since expanded to include collections from continental Europe in affiliation with Europeana and China, Brazil, Australasia now, and most recently a partnership in Africa with the uh, Library of Alexandria. Each affiliated project contributes either provision of technical services, content, or both. And central to the success of the BHL has been a partnership with the Internet Archive. So it's really great to be presenting with Chris from the Archive today. Um, the Archive has, is a not-for-profit organisation and it has just this tiny little mission which is to record and make access to all, univer uh, universal access to all recorded knowledge. Good luck with that. <laughs> uh, the archive already hosts a vast amount of digitised literature and has the resources and expertise to host the content of the BHL as well as assist with a lot of the scanning. Uh, once a book has been uploaded, the archive's internal processes create the OCR text and all the derivatives that are available for download or online viewing. In reality, the BHL comprises two distinct projects, each sharing the same mutual objective of open access to knowledge. On the one hand, we have the digitisation project, which is about scanning books, and on the other is this an online project to develop the systems and deliver the content to its audience. So with such a large amount of data online, the issue of access changes from a question of how do I get hold of a resource to one of how do I find the information I want and how can I share it with others. For many users, the first contact with the BHL is through the various portal sites which reflect the regional contributors. Uh, in addition to the standard title, subject and author searches, these search functions are tuned to the requirements of the local scientific community and, for example, the search results for a particular region may place emphasis on the results uh, that are results showing species or publications from that area. 
And built into the BHL is a link to the UBIO taxon finder resource, which is a huge database of species names. And uh, there's a, the BHL has a service to scour the OCR text for species names within the full text and uh, return results based on the plant or animal's Latin name. A new feature that's currently under development by the Australian Nodes partners at the CSIRO is a full text search on the entire collection. It uses an enhanced Lucene search um, to produce results very quickly from the complete text. And we're, it's scheduled to be available on the Australian site in beta form in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. Um, we're very excited because at the moment there's no way of, of actually searching the text uh, of, a, of, a, of a book. Further tools of the research, for the researcher are available through the SiteBank service, which generates customised bibliographies based on species citations and allows the user to build up a personalised library of the species and the related text that they're in, interested in. Um, there's also the BioStore project, which is a user-developed project, um, a really great service by a uh, fellow in Glasgow who has been spending the last year or so, I don't know, He's been doing some extensive work in extracting articles out of, of the periodicals and journals that are on the BHL collection, which makes it far more useful for researchers if you're looking for a particular, a particular article to cite. Um, yeah, so the BHL is committed to sharing data using open web standards. It's important for the success of the project that data held by the BHL is widely used and, and and it's reused in creative ways. Book metadata is published as OAI PMH queries and returns metadata in either Dublin Core or MODS formats. The books themselves can be referenced by DOI or persistent URL and individual pages can also be accessed by open URLs. So before I go any further, I'd better mention the C word. The BHL walks the copyright tightrope pretty carefully. It has to because no library wants to get embroiled in a copyright suit with, its publish with publishers and the BHL relies on the goodwill of its contributors to succeed. The heritage part of the Biodiversity Heritage Library indicates the historical nature of the library's collection. Some of the digitised titles in the collection date back to the 15th century and at least 70% are over 100 years old and, and are well and truly in the public domain. We do get into a bit of murky territory with definitions of public no domain across uh, different uh, national jurisdictions. So by default, the limit has been 90 years from date of publication or about n anything published prior 1923 is considered public domain as far as the BHL is concerned. Um, the remainder has been published copyright free or the contributing institution has explicitly sought permission of the copyright holder to put the material online. And the Australian node is hoping to fill up, to, to complete some of the holdings of journals and uh, serial publications that are already partially in the BHL up to that 1923 limit by acquiring permission to, to uh, digitise more recent volumes um, from, Australian, from Australian publishers. We want people to be able to access the combined literary resources of some of the world's great natural history collections, and it's hoped that they will be able to put this resource to good use. To this end, a memorandum of understanding has been signed between all the participants to the effect that material currently in the public domain that's been made available by the Biodiversity Heritage Library remains in the public domain, and no party shall claim intellectual copyrights over the original or any derivative version. The metadata is all uh, released under Creative Commons share alike non-commercial licence and so that goes for copyright uh, documents within copyright for which permission has been sought. Um, certainly the more recent publications there are online on the BHL the more useful it can be to scientific research. So we're actively engaged in negotiating with copyright holders. Um, so who uses this stuff? Without a doubt, the largest segment of users for the BHL are the scientific community. Many researchers in the field of taxonomy depend on the BHL as a major resource, and these people need access to authoritative bibliographies and first descriptions of species so that they can do their research. 
Digital access saves them an enormous amount of time and a lot of headaches if they can't find what they want. And a second segment of our, the BHL's audience are the people who appreciate the art of the scientific, of the scientific illustrations and the bibliophiles, people like me, who have a general interest in the collection and for whom such a deep collection of historical books represents hours of fascination. Finally, the other group, last but not least, that of uh, users that we'd like to encourage are the developers and the metadata junkies out there who can creative reuse and mash up the bibliographic data and the content to develop their own technology projects. These are the people who add the value to the collection, who surprise us with the novel ways of reimagining the knowledge residing in historical literature and presenting it to the world. To aid these people and those who wish to mine the data set for research, the BHL has a published API which allows access to the metadata and content using open web standards. And if you're interested in accessing that, the documentation can be found on any of the local portal sites. In this part of the world, the local branch of the BHL was set up to provide a literature service for the Atlas of Living Australia project. Um, this has been coordinated from Melbourne by Museum Victoria. And since the middle of last year, we have put in place a local portal for the collection of and developed uh, software and tools to facilitate our regional cont contribution and design the workflow for digitisation of books from our local libraries. The focus has been on accessing Australian collections, but as I mentioned, I'm keen on expanding our scope to include literature from elsewhere in the region, especially from here. Uh, our scanning operation is intentionally small scale. Uh, thousands of titles have been scanned already by the big libraries, including many publications from Australia and New Zealand. We don't have the resources to digitise large volumes of material, but what we can do is target our operation to fill in the gaps that the big guys have left. So to direct our scanning effort, we have developed a website where we encourage our users within the scientific community or the general interest community to nominate titles that, and vote on their priority for, for the scanning list. We initially seeded the database for this list with a bibliography, uh, bibliography obtained from Australian government species registers and ordered the list according to the number of citations we found. This initial list came at about 7,000 titles, which is not a small number for us, uh, but we've had to pull out quite a few duplicates. We allow our users to vote with a simple like type system, so if you can use Facebook, you can use our bid list, and that adds a weighting to the title to move it up in the list. Similarly, titles added by users carry a greater weight than the seed list. So hopefully our scanning, eventually our scanning list will reflect something close to the preferences of our community of users. In general, we're focused on completing the runs of locally published material uh, and public, locally published serial titles that are represented in the BHL already but might have incomplete holdings. Then we're targeting the small, the niche publications, such as those put out by the amateur naturalist clubs and uh, other small clubs and societies, the royal societies as well. Um, we're also hoping to digitise some of the beautiful rare books from our collection, because each of the, the museum partners in the BHL in Australia have fabulous collections of old and wonderful rare books. And, uh, the, many of these may be hard to obtain and have hand-coloured illustrations or are unique in some way. So we began digitising from Museum Victoria's library using our BookDrive Pro copy stand and uh, just before Christmas, but we only really began in earnest in February when we put in place a volunteer program to do the image capture and the post-processing. In that time, we've only digitised about 70 volumes and 50 of those have been uploaded, but, which is tiny compared to the 7,000 on our list, but we're making headway and it's actually starting to, we're starting to get a lot more throughput now. I suppose when I started out on the digitisation project, I didn't realise that just what a manual process it was going to be. The image capture is very hands-on and quite physical. Uh, but a good, on a good day, we can get through about 1,000 pages in an hour and when we were selecting our digitisation platform, we chose the book drive system because it allowed for pages to be photographed flat without unbinding the volumes, and which was particularly important for our conservators if we were going to digitise any of the rare material. So once we've imaged a book, the files are batch processed out of Adobe Bridge from Camera Raw to TIFF, 
and then each file is manually cropped and straightened in Photoshop. I've evaluated a number of different solutions for the image processing, but from what I've experienced so far, the best results and the most efficient process has been to do post-production in Photoshop. This stage takes by far the longest, so we've got two workstations set up processing files from the one capture rig. So since the beginning of February, most of our digitisation has been carried out by volunteers from the museum's volunteer project program. We have six people who are committed to the project until the end of July, and they've been operating the image capture system and carrying out post-processing. When they started, they all had only very basic uh, computer skills and were a bit overwhelmed by the amount that they had to learn. We provided training and to begin with supervised them closely until they became familiar with the process. But as their confidence in operating the machinery has grown, so has their output. And on average of late, we've been getting through about four books a day per person. And we've got two volunteers on a day for three days a week. They're a great bunch of people from very different backgrounds and have all have become very passionate about their contribution to the BHL and they're keen to contribute to the project in the future. Owing to the physical and repetitive aspect of the imaging, I've been nice to them and established a buddy system where they're paired up and swapped jobs at regular intervals. Each pair is res responsible for digitising their allocated books for the day and they usually exceed their targets. I haven't even had to bribe them. But to keep them interested, I ha we have regular morning teas and they get to go on special viewings of the rare book collection and the other collection areas of the museum, which keeps them coming back. It's great. <laughs> the final part of the workflow, which at the moment I haven't handed over to the volunteers yet, uh, is the process of adding metadata and uploading to the Internet Archive. For this bit, we've been using some software developed by the Smithsonian Libraries for their BHL contribution, known as Macaw. It's a server-based tool. It's a server-based tool which allows post-processed images to be packaged up with the items, bibliographic record and page data in a format that we can upload to the archive. It makes uh, metadata entry a very streamlined process and ensures a level of quality control prior to committing an item to the repository. Barring any quality issues with the page images, page, uh, data entry for a 300-page book can be completed in about 15 minutes. The reason I haven't been training volunteers in Macaw is that that's still very much under development. It was initially designed to integrate very tightly with the Smithsonian's workflow and took a fair amount of hacking on our part to make it work for us. But since we began using it, a number of other contributors have expressed interest in adopting Macaw. And I'm very excited about the prospects for using this tool as a way of expanding our contribution. So the local BHL developers and I have been collaborating very closely with the guys in Washington to redesign the workflow within the application as well as develop a number of functional improvements. And one of the major developments that I hope to have operational, um, hopefully by the end of April, is to be able to host the metadata upload system on a server where remote BHL contributors can log in and submit their digitised files and commit their contribution in just one or two easy steps. This will be great because after a couple of months of scanning, it's apparent to me that we're never going to get through the entire list of titles that we'd like to digitise. We can still make a valuable contribution, however, because after talking to people at various libraries around the country, I've discovered that there's a significant amount of digitisation that's been quietly going on in the background already. This realisation has caused me to have a bit of a think, rethink about how we can allocate our resources to maximise the amount of content that's uploaded from local libraries. It would be foolish to rescan books that have already been digitised, right? So our emphasis has changed to focus on making it as easy as possible for the institutions themselves to contribute their own digital assets to the BHL using the McCaw metadata tool. So at this point, there is little published material well, little has been contributed from New Zealand, and um, I think it'd be great if libraries or museums here who have already got digitised material, literary material relating to biological sciences would like to, uh, if they would like to contribute that through the McCaw process, I'd love to hear from them. So what does the future hold for the BHL? Oh, this little map shows the uh, dis distribution of contributions of publications in, on the BHL. Um, yeah, so what's the future? Unfortunately, in many parts of the world, money is getting hard to come by for further digitisation projects. Right now, the digitisation operations are winding down among a lot of the US contributors and also in Europe, but this doesn't mean that the collection will remain static. The Smithsonian's an exception to this rule, and I believe that they're continuing to scan at a cracking pace. 
So much of the recent contributions will be coming from them and also from China, who have really got on board. In the US, a technical team has just received a grant to develop crowdsourcing tools to correct OCR text and identify and describe illustrations from the collection. So there'll still be plenty of development going on. As I mentioned, our partners within the Atlas of Living Australia and the CSIRO are working with us to develop further search tools as well. Um, our little node runs out of money towards the end of the year, and at the moment we're seeking new sources of funding. But in spite of this, we're well positioned to continue our contribution with the volunteer program in place. Once the, with the volunteer program in place, and once the Macaw portal is set up, I'm hopeful that we'll continue digitising, uploading content, even if other parts of the project are scaled back. So the world's biosphere is changing at an unprecedented rate, and in, and. Un, yet new species are still being discovered. So, and to be able to document these species and describe them, the scientists need to have access to their library. So the Biodiversity Heritage Library plays a vital part in giving access to the literature for the benefit of science. And the more complete the library, the greater the use it'll be for scientists in the future. So we hope we can keep digitising. Thank you. <laughs>